In this video, we are going to talk about the transform of 1 over z, where z is a complex number. This here is our overview slide, which we will spend five minutes or less just getting a feel for what we will cover, and then we will go through each topic in much more detail and with examples. For your reference, I have these algebraic properties of complex conjugates and modulus. We'll go over a couple that we will be using in particular. The next thing we'll do is we will look at the transformation t on a complex number z is equal to 1 over z. And to analyze this, we're going to break this function here, or this transform here, into a composition of two other transforms that are easier to analyze. So in particular, t of z equals 1 over z is a composition of two functions. The first function is capital Z, takes the complex number and maps it to the complex number over its modulus squared, which is equal to, according to our algebraic properties, z over z, z bar. And we will see that this first simplified function is an inversion with respect to the circle, the unit circle. In other words, points exterior to the unit circle are mapped to non-zero points interior to the circle. And conversely, points interior to the circle are mapped to points outside of the circle, and any point on the circle is mapped to itself. The second step of our, the second uh, function that composes to give t of z is w of z, taking this capital Z here that we got from step one, is equal to uh, the complex conjugate of z. And the second step is a reflection across the real axis. And we will find some other properties here of t of x plus iy is equal to x over x squared plus y squared minus iy over x squared plus y squared. The next thing we will note is the transformation t of z equals 1 over z maps circles and lines into circles and lines. And we show this by looking at the general form of a circle or line, which is given here by this equation. So you can notice if a is equal to 0, you have an equation of a line. And then if a is non-zero, you have an equation of a circle. And what we find is when we have points that satisfy this condition of being part of a circle or line, when we plug it into this transform, t of z equals 1 over z, that we get back the same form of the equation. So in other words, circles and lines are mapped to circles and lines. And then we have these other uh, facts here that we will do some examples of. A circle, that is, when a is not equal to 0, not passing through the origin, that is, d is not 0, and the z-plane is transformed into a circle not passing through the origin in the w-plane. And a circle, a not equal to 0, through the origin, d equals 0, in the z-plane is transformed into a line that does not pass through the origin in the w-plane. And then we look at lines. When a is equal to 0, so we have a line not passing through the origin, d not equal to 0 in the z-plane, is transformed into a circle through the origin in the w-plane. And last, a line, a equals 0 through the origin in the z-plane, is transformed into a line through the origin in the w-plane. That's the overview of what we will be covering in this video. So now we'll look at each of these topics in more detail and with more examples. Here is a review of some of the algebraic properties of the complex conjugate and modulus. We're going to start with this one here, which says the modulus squared equals x squared plus y squared. In other words, the modulus squared is sort of the square of the distance or the length of the vector z. And then we also have that z times its complex conjugate is equal to the modulus squared. And I guess we'll go ahead and work backwards. So this one here, um, when you divide z1 by another complex number z2 and you take the modulus, that's equal to the modulus of z1 divided by modulus of z2. Similarly, when you um, multiply z1 times z2 and then take the modulus, that's the same as multiplying the modulus of z1 times the modulus of z2. Here you have the modulus of the complex conjugate of z1 plus z2 is equal to the modulus, no, I'm sorry, the complex conjugate of z1 plus the complex conjugate of z2, and the modulus of the complex conjugate is equal to the modulus of z, and the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate is just equal to z. 
We are now ready to look at the transform t of z equals 1 over z. And so as to be continuous, we're going to set t of 0 equal to infinity and t of infinity equal to 0. And this property here we'll talk about later on in the slide, but it's part of our summary. So it's up here. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this t of z equals 1 over z and uh, break it up into two successive transformations. And the idea is we have this complex number z, and we want to map it over here in the w plane. So this is in the z plane. Over here, we want the w plane, where you know w is of the form u plus iv. It's another complex number. Our z is equal to x plus iy. So these are two different kind of spaces. So the first thing, instead of going directly from z to w, which is what tz does, we're going to break tz into two phases. The first time we plug z into a function, which um, in your book, it, it's called capital Z. But I put f of z just because when I write the capital Z, it looks a lot like a lowercase z. So our, our first um, transform, our mapping, is f of z, and it takes our complex number, maps it to f of z. That will be our step one. And then from there, we're going to take our resulting f of z and do one more transformation, g, on f of z, which gives us to w. And in effect, we want our f of z and our g of z to be such that our entire transformation, t of z, is equal to g composed of f of z. And so why do we want to complicate this problem so much? And the answer is because f of z is a smaller, simpler function, and g of z is a smaller, simpler function than the composite function t of z. And this will allow us to analyze these two simpler functions, f of, f of z and g of z. And by analyzing them, the two simpler functions, then we can get a feel for what t of z is. Now, this first step, step one, is going to be our capital Z operates on a complex number, and that's equal to the complex number divided by its modulus squared. And according to our algebraic properties, that is equal to Z over Z times Z bar. Now we want to consider the image, the capital Z, the image of these points lowercase z, our starting complex number. So what happens to them when they get mapped over by the capital Z? Well, our capital Z, the modulus of the capital Z, is just the modulus, you know, here we have Z defined, modulus of Z over Z times Z bar, which here we can cancel out the Z's, so we get the modulus of 1 over Z bar, which is equal to, according to our algebraic properties, modulus of 1 divided by modulus of z bar, which is equal to, and according to this property, 1 over modulus of z. So in other words, once we map this complex number z into this capital Z, then the modulus or the length of capital Z, the resulting vector, is exactly the inverse of the length of our original z. And we also know that the angle, the argument of z equals argz, is now preserved because all that's happened is that the modulus has changed. And what that means is anything inside this unit circle, its modulus is going to be less than 1, right? Its radius is going to be less than 1. And then all these points outside the unit circle, these modulus are going to be greater than 1. So for what this transform does is all points exterior to the circle that have radius greater than 1, now when we take the inverse, or 1 over the length, they're all going to be mapped inside the circle. Conversely, everything that's less than 1, when we take 1 over some uh, length less than 1, we're now going to be greater than 1, and we're going to be mapped outside the circle. And any points on the circle, they're just going to be mapped onto itself. Because if the modulus is equal to 1, then these two things are going to be equal. And we can do a couple of examples to illustrate this. So first we'll take a complex number whose modulus is greater than 1. So z equals 1 plus 2i. 
and then we'll take another complex number whose modulus is less than 1, so z equals 1 half plus 1 half i. So these are two different complex numbers, two different z's. And I've graphed them here. So first, I have z equals 1 plus 2i, that's this point in blue, and it's outside our unit circle. Here I have my second complex number, 1 half plus 1 half i, so it's over here, and it's inside the unit circle. Now I'm going to take my first z, 1 plus 2i, and put it into my step 1 transform. That is capital Z of 1 plus 2i. Now that's going to be equal to z, so 1 plus 2i, over the modulus squared. So that's going to be 1 plus 2i times 1 minus 2i, which is equal to 1 plus 2i over 5, which is 1 fifth plus 2 fifths i. And if you graph that, it's over here. And I may not have quite gotten, you know, just pretend this is 1 fifth and this is 2 fifths up. So it is definitely inside the circle. So this point here has been transformed into something inside the circle. Our capital Z of this other complex number, 1 half plus 1 half 2i, which is inside the circle then, becomes our, where is our transformation? Z, which is 1 plus 1 half i, times uh, modulus squared, which is 1 half plus 1 half i, 1 half minus 1 half i, we take that and we get 1 half plus 1 half i over 1 fourth plus 1 fourth, which is equal to 1 plus i. So you can see this graph over here is this green dot 1 plus i. So this one gets this green dot, gets mapped over here to this green dot. The green dot inside the circle goes outside. The blue dot outside the circle comes inside the circle. And in general, and this is a formula we will refer to, that if we have a complex number in the form of a plus ib, that will be equal to a plus ib over a squared plus b squared, just looking at this here, the modulus squared, which is equal to a, the real part will be a over a squared plus b squared, and the imaginary part is b over a squared plus b squared. The second step now, w of z, and this z is the capital Z we got from step one, is equal to, we take this capital Z and we take the complex conjugate. And the second step is a reflection across the real axis. So let's just look at this statement here, the reflection statement first. And we will continue with these examples here. So if I have my z is equal to 1 plus 2i, and I have my other z is equal to 1 half plus 1 half i, I take my capital Z transform, and this uh, green one, the 1 half plus 1 half i, becomes 1 plus i, and this blue one, the 1 plus 2i becomes 1 fifth plus 2 fifths i. Now I take the uh, complex conjugate, so I'm going to get 1 minus i, which is a reflection across the real axis, and here I'm going to get 1 fifth minus 2 fifths i. Again, another reflection across the real axis. And I have the calculation here. t now of 1 plus 2i is the complex co uh, conjugate of our 1 plus 2 fifths i, which is equal to 1 fifth minus 2 fifths i, and t of 1 half plus 1 half i is the complex conjugate of 1 plus i, which is 1 minus i. So now, um, looking at t of a plus i b, that's going to be my a over a squared plus b squared minus, using the complex conjugate, b over a squared plus b squared. And this formula here is one that we will use and is exactly what is noted here for you also on the overview sheet. The only difference instead of uh, our original complex number denoted as a plus ib, we denote our original complex number of x plus iy. And just to verify that these two steps are equivalent to our original transformation, so I'm going to have t of lowercase z, which is equal to w of our uppercase z, which is equal to w uppercase z is equal to our original z over z uh, times z bar. And now for w, I need to take the uh, complex conjugate, so the complex conjugate of z over z times z bar. And using these algebraic properties, then, I can simplify this till eventually I get 1 over z, which is, in fact, the transform we are discussing. 
I'm breaking down this transform into these two transforms of capital Z and then this W here, step one and step two, shows us that our T of Z equals one over Z has the effect of first doing this inversion with respect to the unit circle. Again, points exterior to the circle are mapped to non-zero points interior to the circle, and points interior to the circle are mapped to points exterior to the circle at any point on the circle is mapped onto itself. And then the second thing that happens in this transform is it, there's a reflection across the real axis. The next thing we want to look at is that the transform T of Z equals one over Z maps circles and lines into circles and lines. Next, we're going to use this formula that we had derived a couple of slides back when we were analyzing the transform as a composition of two simpler transforms. And in that uh, derivation for this formula, we had A plus IB, but then when we put it up as, as notes because everything is in terms of Z, we did T of X plus IY is equal to X over X squared plus Y squared minus I times y over x squared plus y squared. And what we are going to do now with this formula is we're going to look at the relationship between the complex number that we plug in to t and the complex number that we get out. So we're going to um, call the complex number we get out of the transformation w. So w equals u plus iv. Often you see that this is a mapping from the z plane to the w plane. So w equals u plus iv which is the transformation of our x plus iy. So looking, uh, substituting this formula here for t of x plus iy and equating the real part u to the real part here, then u is equal to x over x squared plus y squared, and the imaginary part v is equal to minus y over x squared plus y squared. So this is the relationship between our original complex number, x plus iy, and our new complex number, u plus iv. In particular, we don't have to do the whole transform as we did it in two steps. We could just use this formula. And then last, since w and uh, z are simply inverses of each other because the transform is defined as the inverse, or one over z, so w is equal to one over z, then z is equal to one over w, so the relationship between x and y with w is x is equal to u over u squared plus v squared, and y is equal to minus v over u squared plus v squared. So now we're going to consider this form of equation, which represents either a line or circle. So when a does not equal to 0, this form has the squares and the x's, so you can complete the square and get a formula for a circle, the standard formula for a circle. And when a equals 0, you can see we have the equation of a line. So if our x and y originally going into our transformation, this z, satisfies the condition of being on a circle or line, in other words, our x and y satisfies this equation here, ax squared plus y squared plus bx plus cy plus d equals 0. Now when we look at the transform of x plus iy, and again, this x plus iy satisfies our condition of being on a line or circle. So t of x plus iy equals u plus iv. And we also know that this transform, the, then, is going to relate to u and v in this manner, right? As we said over here, the x is going to be u over u squared plus v squared, and y is going to be minus v over u squared plus v squared. So now we can plug this in, these this u over u squared plus v squared and my minus v over u squared plus y, uh, plus v squared into this formula and see um, what will happen, like what form we get. So we're going to plug in our x squared, which is u squared plus u squared plus v squared squared times a, and then we're going to have our y squared, which is v squared over u squared plus v squared squared, also times a, and our b times our, u, our x, our c times our y, and our d. We then do some algebraic manipulations, and you can see what we finally get is we get a times 1 over u squared plus v squared plus b times u over u squared plus v squared plus c times minus v over u squared plus 
b squared plus d, we can multiply this equation, the whole equation, by u squared plus v squared, and we'll get a plus bu minus vc plus d times u squared plus v squared. So our u's and v's that make up w after our transformation is still in the form of a line or circle. It is still in this form here. It's just that now d is in front of the u squared plus v squared. This should have been a squared, sorry. And then our b is in front of u, our c is in front of v, and then now our a becomes the constant that d used to be. On our overview sheet, we're over here. We have the general form of a line or circle is ax squared plus y squared plus bx plus cy plus d equals zero with b squared plus c squared greater than 4ad. So when a is not zero, then we have a circle. And again, when a is zero, we have a line. And we know, we just showed that if x and y satisfy the above conditions here, of being a circle or line, then when it is transformed, it is still a circle or line. And it is, in particular, it is transformed to this circle or line, d u squared plus v squared plus b u minus c v plus a equals zero. And the next four statements we will state without proof, but we will do examples. So we will have a circle, that is when a is not zero, not passing through the ori origin, that is d is not zero, and the z-plane is transformed into a circle not passing through the origin in the w-plane. The next statement, again, a circle, not zero, passing through the origin, d equals zero in the z-plane, is transformed into a line that does not pass through the origin, oh, yeah, that does not pass through the origin in the w-plane. Now we're going to look at lines. A line when a is equal to zero, not passing through the origin, d not zero, in the z-plane is transformed into a circle through the origin in the w-plane, and a line passing through the origin, this is now passing through the origin in the z-plane, is transformed into a line through the origin in the w-plane. And the interesting thing is whether or not something becomes a circle and, or a line after the transform, depends on whether it passes through the origin. So here we have something that does not pass through the origin, d not zero. Here we have not passing through the origin. And in this case, we have a circle not passing through the origin. In this case, we have a line not passing through the origin. But both of them become circles. So this is transformed to a circle. Here we have a circle passing through the origin and a line passing through the origin and both of them become lines. I'm not sure I have enough colors, but this is through the origin, this one's through the origin, and it becomes transformed to a line. So whether or not you get transformed into a line or circle depends whether or not you go through the origin. And I have that summed up here. So not through the origin, it goes to a circle. Through the origin, it goes to a line. I have those notes moved over here to give us more space to do the example. And not through the origin implies circle. Through the origin implies line. I moved up to over here, again, just to give us more space. Our first example is describe the transformation t of z equals 1 over z of a vertical line x equals c1, where c1 is not equal to 0. And I have a little example graph over here. Here's x equals 1. Here's x equals c1. Looking at this equation, x equals c1, I want to put that in this form. So here, a is equal to 0 because there's no x squared terms. Um, b, oh, there is an x term, so I need a b. There's no y term, so c is equal to 0. And d, that's my constant. That will equal to c1 which means that b should be equal to negative 1 because what I would have then is um, my a goes away because it's 0, my c, this goes away, my y term goes away, my b here is minus x and my d is c1, so when I move the x over I get x is equal to c1. So 
these are my coefficients for a, b, c, and d. a is 0, b is negative 1, c is equal to 0, and d is equal to c1. Again, when we put these coefficients in here, then our general equation for a line or plane becomes the line x equals c1. And then what we have is from over here, and I just rewrote it here, if x and y satisfy the above condition of being a circular line, and here we have a line, then when it is transformed, it is still a circular line, and we are given this equation by the new circular line. So we're going to use d, which is c1 times u squared plus v squared, plus b, which is minus 1 times u, c is 0, a is 0, equals 0. So our new equation becomes minus c1 u squared plus v squared plus u equals 0. So this is the equation of our new line or circle actually because of the squared terms this becomes a circle which also goes through here this is a line not passing through the origin in the z-plane it's transformed into a circle so again we have a circle and we can also complete the square and put it into our normal form so we can see where the circle is centered at um, 1 uh, 2c1 and 0 and what the radius is, which is 1 over 2c1. And just to reiterate, we did an example of this third one here, a line not passing through the origin in the z-plane is transformed into a circle through the origin in the w-plane. And so this is it. The transformation of tz equals 1z of a vertical line, x equals c1, is a circle given to us by this equation, minus c1 u squared plus v2 plus u equals 0. Let's consider the case where C1 is greater than 0 and look at the circle that it draws. So let's take the example of C1 is equal to 1 third. Looking at this completing the square, then the center of the circle is at 1 half divided by 1 third. So that'll put the x coordinate for the center at 3 halves. Over here, because it's v minus 0 squared, that means the y, the center, uh, y coordinate of the center is at 0. So the, cent the center of the circle will be at 3 halves over here, and the radius is going to be 1 half uh, times 1 over C1. That is going to be 1 half, and then 1 over C1 is just 3, so it's going to be equal to 3 halves. And so here is the drawing of our circle centered at 3 halves 0 with a radius of 1 and 1 half. As we look at C1y, so this line here, as we, if we take this point by point and then you know, take each point and then plot it to a point on the circle, we'll notice as we move up the line, up the entire line through infinity, that we will be plotting points in this, on the circle in a clockwise direction. As, so as C1y moves up the entire line, its image traverses the circle once in the clockwise direction. Furthermore, just as um, in a previous slide, we said t of z equals 1 over z, and to be um, continuous, we had to say the point at infinity in the extended z plane corresponds to the origin in the w plane. So that's over here. Now we will consider a c1 less than 0. So for example, we'll consider c1 is equal to minus 1 half. Looking plugging in one half here into this equation for our circle, we get the center is going to be 1 over 2c1. c1 is equal to minus 1 half. That will give us minus 1. And then our y is going, coordinate is going to be 0. Our radius is 1 over 2c1, our radius squared. So we are going to have negative 1 since it's you know going to be, the radius is actually always positive. So radius is equal to 1. So here we have our center at minus 1, 0, radius equals 1, so it does hit the 0, and then it hits negative 2 over here. So the circle is to the left of the v-axis as C1y moves up the entire line. So as we, if we did this point by point, as we got larger and larger points along here, its image traverses the circle once in the counterclockwise direction. You can do a similar analysis for horizontal line C2 equals 1 half and also a horizontal line that's where the C2 is less than 0 and you will see you get circles for C2 equals 1 half 
where your original line is above the axis, you will get a circle below the axis in a clockwise direction. When C2 is negative, you'll see, and below this axis, you'll see your circle now is above the axis, and it's in the counterclockwise direction. So that would be still looking over here. It's a line not passing through the origin in the z-plane. It's transformed into a circle through the origin. Again, all of these circles contain the origin in the w-plane. For our last example, we will describe the transformation t of z equals 1 over z of the half-plane x is greater than or equal to c1, where c1 is greater than 0. For this example, we are going to use results from our previous example because we can consider building up this half plane line by line. That is, our previous example was one line here, let's say x equals c1, now x is greater than c1, but we can keep adding more lines, all of them greater than c1, and if we add enough lines, like infinitely many lines, essentially, essentially we will have the plane expressed here, x is greater than c1. And what we have from our last example is given our line x equals c, it's transformed to the circle u minus 1 over 2c squared plus b squared plus 1 over 2c squared. And the other thing we note, as c increases, the lines x equals c move to the right. So if we have c1 here and then we have a new c that's larger, this C is larger than C1, our lines move to the right, and the images, because of the radius, it's inversely proportional to C, are going to shrink. So here we have X equals C1, we might have, uh, where is C1? This radius here, and then X equals C, we're going to have this radius here. So as we have fill in all of these lines, then we're just going to fill in, essentially starting at x equals c1, that's going to be our biggest circle, and then when we move over just a little bit, we're going to have a little bit smaller circle, actually they all touch x equals 0, and then we keep going, and as we keep going, we're just going to fill in, eventually we're going to fill in this whole disk, and at this point, we call this a disk, not a circle, remember, we call a circle is equi all the points equidistant from the center. So the circle is just the outside, this outside here. And it's the outside because we have this equality. But now if we're looking at the disk, it's going to be less than or equal. So a disk is everything inside and including the boundary. Which means our transformation t of z equals 1 over z maps the half plane x is greater than c1, where c1 is greater than 0, onto the disk of radius equals to 1 over 2c1. And this is the equation of the disk that it's mapped to. To review what we have discussed in this video, we started with a review of some algebraic properties of complex numbers, their complex conjugates, and their modulus. And then we looked at the transform t of z equals 1 over z, kind of this division transform. And in order to analyze it, we broke up this transform into two steps. Or in other words, we made this into a composition of two other functions, the first one being capital Z, which we set equal to our original complex number divided by its modulus squared, which is also, according to these algebraic properties, is equal to z over z, z uh, con conjugate, complex conjugate. And we saw that this first step, in effect, is an inversion with respect to the unit circle. In other words, points that complex numbers z that are exterior to the circle z equals 1 are mapped to non-zero points interior to the circle. So points exterior get mapped inside. And conversely, points that are originally interior, complex numbers interior to the circle, are then mapped to non-zero points outside of the circle. And any points on the circle is mapped to itself. Our second step is then we take this capital Z and we take its um, complex conjugate. And this second step is a reflection across the real axis, which means our transformation T of Z, one, is an inversion of the circle 
and then a reflection across the axis. And we did um, a couple of examples of the step one, step two, as well as the entire transformation. Then the second thing we looked at is this transformation t of z equals 1 over z maps circles and lines into circles and lines. And to show this, we started with this general form of a circle or line, because you'll recognize if a is not equal to 0, here you have the x squared and y squared terms, the x and y terms, so you can complete the square and you can get your standard form of a circle. When a is equal to 0, so this goes away, you can see you have the standard equation, or you can put it in point slope or whatever form you want, but you can see this is an equation of a line. So we said that if x and y satisfy these conditions here of being either a circle or a line, when it's transformed by this t of z equals 1 over z, it will be transformed to another circle or line. And the form, the circle or line it will be transformed is, is this variable d times u squared plus v squared plus this variable b times u minus this variable c times v plus this variable a. And we did examples of that. And the four uh, cases we looked at a circle, that is where a is not zero, not passing through the origin, that is d is not zero, and the z plane is transformed into a circle not passing through the origin in the w plane. And a circle, a not zero, through the origin, d equals zero, and the z plane is transformed into a line that does not pass through the origin in the w plane. Then second, a line not passing through the origin in the z plane is transformed into a circle through the origin, and a line through the origin in the z plane is transformed into a line through the origin in the w plane. So kind of summarizing this up a little bit, it's a lot of words, but just remember, if you don't go through the origin, then you're going to map to a circle. If you go through the origin, you're going to map through a line. So a line or a circle that doesn't pass through the origin will become a circle. A line or a circle through the origin becomes a line. So this wraps up this video. We'll have a couple more videos, a couple more transforms next. And in the meantime, thank you for watching.